I would like to go through an example of how to report uh, your homework problems so that you can get full credit. Now, I've um, made these these templates for you, and I encourage you to use these templates because this is exactly how I'm going to grade. Um, you'll look at this um, template and you'll see I've got numbers of points in each of five different um, categories. Uh, on the far left, there's a column on one page for focusing on the situation. That's just a qualitative description of what you're going to do. Um, after that, on the same page, there's a um, mathematize your situation. Uh, in this case, what you're going to do is you're basically going to take everything on this left-hand side of the page and turn it into a mathematical description so that you'll be able to work on mathematical stuff later on um, and actually uh, get a solution to what you're going to do. Um, the third full page one is perform the mathematics. You see that there are various places for you to do each step of your um, problem. Uh, and if you have more than four, three steps, you can all you can always print out a second one of those pages, or you know use another page. Uh, this is fairly simple. And um, then the last page, the top part is checking your solution. So you're going to look at the solution from part three and um, see how well it, how well it works mathematically, um, physically, and how well it actually answers the qualitative question. And then the fifth part is you're going to take the um, solution and turn it into a um, verbal or um, pictorial answer. All right. uh, those five steps um, constitute a full report for one of these homework problems. Um, so, so this will help you out later on when you're trying to figure out how to explore a problem space. Now the problem I'm going to look at is uh, this one up here. It's called. It's a freight car of mass M rolls along the rails uh, along rails of negligible friction. The car is brought to rest by a compression spring of stiffness K and maximum compression L. If a car compresses completely, the spring will buckle, uh, toppling the car. Uh, how fast can the car be operated? Um, and y you might wonder what a compression spring is. That's a spring that obeys Hooke's law when it compresses, but not when it's um, when it's extended. Simple enough. So, what we want to just start off with is just to physically draw the situation. Right? There's no better way to get a qualitative understanding of what you're doing than to sit here and just draw it out. You draw out the car, you draw out the rails, and you draw out the little spring. Uh, maybe you put a little a little um, arrow with a V on it to show you which way the um, which way the velocity is, which way the cart's actually moving. All of these things are um, things that help you get a good qualitative picture of what's going on before you answer the problem, before you start choosing methods to so solve the problem with. You're going to have to do that soon enough, but the first thing is just to get a good um, image in your mind of what's really going on. So I'd like you to make a sketch like this, all right? And if you don't make a sketch, you don't get any points for it. And I want it to be clear. If you make a very difficult to understand sketch, then um, you're going to get one point or uh, three points. Um, I also want the um, sketch to have um, basically all of the important information in it. All right. Uh, I don't. I don't want to have to try to figure out is that is that thing a cart or is it a um, or is it a box or is it a uh, hexagon or whatever. Uh, it should look reasonably like a um, cartoon car, right? Um, but if you have a clear, complete, correct sketch of the physical situation, you'll get all the points for drawing the um, drawing the picture. Okay, and then what you want to do is you want to restate the question. You want to put the question in. Uh, slightly more precise terms, right? You're going to do this all the time in industry, right? You're going to have a sort of vague goal and you're going to want to make it clearer. And you're going to have to make it clearer before you start deciding what sort of mathematics you're going to use, right? So first you, you want to know how fast can the car be operated, operated right? Well, what does that mean? Well, it means to find a maximum, right? Uh, what is the most speed that this thing can have uh, without compressing the spring all the way, 
uh, so that it buckles and topples the car. You don't want that to happen. That's a, uh, that's a bad thing to have happen um, if you're in a mine or something like that. And um, you just don't want it to happen, right? So as an engineer, you try to prevent that from happening. So uh, what I've written down here is that I want to know what the maximum safe speed of the freight car is on these rails. Well, and but at this point now you know what you, you know you have a good idea of what's going on you should you have a good qualitative idea and you might want to try to think about different ways you could solve the problem um, mathematically what sort of physical concepts you can use to turn the problem into mathematics um, so uh, you know I know at this point in your in your life it's you know, you don't have a lot of experience. You're not really sure. Well, I shouldn't say say that. I don't know who exactly you are, but most students um, have a really difficult time uh, when they're taking their first physics classes, uh, uh, sort of figuring out the difference between the physics and the mathematics. So, so it's a good idea to sit around here and try to figure out what part is physics and what part is mathematics. Um, in this particular um, case, uh, what we're looking at is um, something that something has to stop, right? So we need to know um, something that has to do with stopping the car. Uh, good. Uh, so the velocity is going to have to go to zero. Um, so you have um, acceleration will do that, but you could also use energy methods. Um, and in fact, I think energy methods are the way to go here. Um, and for energy methods, there are two ways you can do it, I think. There's conservation of energy and there's the work energy theorem. Um, and conservation of energy is usually easier. You don't have to perform any integrals or anything like that. Uh, so that's what we're going to do here. Now, if you look on Blackboard, I've done a slightly different problem than this on Blackboard, and I put that up, put up, put that up in the same rubric. And in that case, I don't neglect the friction, right? So those rails have friction, and uh, and um, well maybe not the rails, but um, the the axle would have friction. Um, I, I did get this this um, problem out of the book, so now I'm thinking about it. There's a there are a couple of problems with this statement, but. Um, but you are going, I do say, okay, you're losing energy in, in this particular case. And in that case, you can't use conservation of energy because the energy is being lost. So unless you know how much energy is being lost, you have some sort of rate or something, you have to use um, the work energy theorem. Uh, and so that's what I do. So if you want to look at what happens with the work energy theorem, uh, which you also looked at last semester, um, you, can, you can look at that and see the slight differences. Uh, it basically takes one more step, and it take, requires doing an integral, uh, which shouldn't be too much of a problem for you at this point. But, I mean, that's what, what you have to do. So, um, in this case, either, either of those would probably be perfectly fine. And you could probably use Newton's second law if you do everything exactly right. Actually, you have to use Newton's second law to do the work energy theorem. Um, but... Uh, as long as as long as you have a good clear idea of that physical concept, and that physical concept will help you to solve the problem, I don't care what it is. Okay, you just give me one that works, and and I'll give you full credit. All right. Um, now I want to make sure that you don't use um, symbols in this. Right, this is still qualitative. I don't want to see an equation here. Um, but beyond that, as long as it's correct, you're going to get full credit, as, as long as it's one way that you can solve this problem. Okay, so now, um, now we're just going to list the things we know about the system, right? We have to, we should know what we know before we try to solve things. Um, in this particular case, like a lot of the questions that you're going to have in the book, uh, you know, they've already named things for you. They've already, they've told you the car, freight car mass and they've given you a symbol to let you know that you know what that is, all right? Um, your answer is going to have to be in terms of these known properties, right, plus any sort of universal constants. Uh, I, you don't have to write um, universal constants here. Um, 
I can believe that the, I, I'm, I'm going to know what the acceleration due to gravity is when you define the weight later on, right? So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but what I do want here is I want a list of each thing, right? So that you know, and um, a symbol that goes with it. Um, the reason for this is otherwise there'd be a lot of a lot of extra writing. I don't generally want symbols on this side, but for this last part, I do put them in here because we need to know those symbols when we're solving the problem. And now you'll see here that I've got everything I've got everything listed here for um, the car. I know I know its mass and things I know about the spring, and I've categorized them. Uh, spring stiffness, which is K, and the maximum cr compression, which is L. That, that's the farthest that we can um, compress this thing. Um, give me the names, give me the symbols, and it's a um, sort of complete list. You get full credit. Um, So next thing you want, you're going to want to do is do a diagram, a helpful diagram that's going to help you out when you're trying to solve the problem. So this is not a picture, right? This is not a um, physical sketch. This is something that lets me know that you're thinking about, you know, what's interacting with what. And in this case, what we're really worried, the only thing we're really worried about is the spring interact interacting with the car. Um, so I've drawn a free body diagram. Now this probably isn't really necessary. Uh, this is prob there probably, there are better, um, there are better diagrams for this particular case because it's a, um, because it's an energy question. Unfortunately, I don't like those diagrams um, for pedagogical reasons. So uh, people, other people like them for pedagogical reasons. I don't like them for um, pedagogical reasons because they don't, they don't actually show what somebody's really going to think. So, so it's a, so if you use something like an energy bar chart, that's going to show, you know, that's going to show you um, what's happening, right? As far as the energy, as far as energy is being conserved. There's some energy over here and it goes over there, right? Uh, however, um, that's, not, that's not really uh, a chart or a diagram that physicists use, right? Uh, whereas something like a free body diagram is something that physicists just learn to do anyway, right? It's it's a um, it's a good sketch of the system. Um, also, this would be very good for the work energy theorem, and I, like I said, um, I've already done this with uh, with um, friction, and I needed to use the work energy theorem for that. But anyways, just a clear, helpful diagram that lets me that lets me know you're thinking about how to put the problem together. That's what you need here. Um, yeah. Uh, now I want to figure out what it is I want to solve for. Okay. Um, and there are two different things I think you could say you wanted to solve for here. Right. So remember, um, in part, uh, 1B, we said that we wanted to find the maximum safe speed of the freight car. So I could always just use that as what I wanted to solve for. I could just say, okay, I want to find that safe speed. Um, but what I, what another, another thing I can find is the compression of the spring for a given speed, for any given speed. And then later on, um, I can compare that to um, the maximum compression. And that's actually what I'm going to do. Um, there are a couple of reasons to do that. The biggest one is that I want to, I want for the last, step for answering the question, show you the difference between what I want you to do when you solve for, when you solve for a, a um, variable that doesn't directly um, answer the question in part 1b, and when you do answer the question in part 1b. So that's part of the reason why I chose this delta x rather than um, the uh, maximum velocity. I just, I just want to look at this final compression of the spring and this is a good thing to do, right? Uh, so even though I'm looking at looking for the maximum safe speed of the freight car, I'm going to solve for something else, and that's going to give me that maximum safe speed. Um, here again, just like in uh, part 1D, 
I want you to give me a name, the final compression of the spring, and I want you to give me a symbol, in this case, delta x. Um, because I want to use the delta x somewhere in an equation, and I want to know what that thing means. Okay, now I want to um, have an equation, right? So in the, this part two, what I'm doing is I'm mathematizing things, right? And now I want to start putting t equations together. And what I want now is to take 1C, conservation of energy, right? And I want to turn that into a, a uh, mathematical equation that I can use in my, um, that I can use, right, in my solution. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, the initial energy is equal to the final energy. The, so the initial, the sum of the initial kinetic energy and the initial potential energies is equal to the sum of the final kinetic energy and the final potential energy. Okay, and the most uh, there, there are two important things for this, right? One is that it matches the concept in part one C. Now there might be multiple equa equations that match what you wrote down in part 1c. Uh, so that concept may have different equations for different conditions. I want you to write down the one that you're actually going to use in your work, all right? Not the one that you think best exemplifies the, um, the concept. So um, in this case, uh, you know, you'll get full credit if the equation matches the concept and it's actually used. You lose a point if, it's, if it matches the concept and it's not used. Um, you'll lose two points if it does not match the concept but it is an equation you actually used. Uh, you'll lose three points if, um, if neither, is, uh, if neither is, is there, if it neither matches the concept nor is used in the work. Um, you'll get one point if you just write down an equation, but it's not an equation that you actually used. Um, at, well, if you write down an equation that's not valid, but you put something in there, right? Um, and you get nothing if you give me no equation at all. Um, yeah, so now you want to do things to connect the uh, what you have in 2C to the things you know in 1D, and, of course, to the variable in 2B that you're actually going to solve for. Um, so, in this case, what we have are kinetic and potential energies. Uh, the kinetic energy has the same form as always, so I write that down, k equals one-half mv squared. The potential energy is the potential energy for a spring, right? The potential energy for a spring is one-half times spring stiffness times the um, square of the compression, or extension as well, but the square of the compression. So, th and that's all you have to do is put a bunch of connecting equations that you actually use in the um, solution. So as long as they're correct and you use them in the solution, then you're going to be perfectly fine. And then we do what you've been waiting for. I mean, this is what you really, really love doing, right? That's why you're in this physics class, is you love um, just solving equations. That, th that's what, what you've come here to do, all right? So, um, so now that you know what, how to mathematize this, I just want you to solve it, right? And um, so you just write down your step. Like here I say step one is to write down the um, energy before and after. And so the initial energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential. But at the beginning, right when the um, car hits the spring, the spring isn't compressed at all. So there's no initial potential energy, and we just have one, the initial energy is, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Uh, similarly, for the final, at the maximum compression, um, the K, Kf is zero because the speed is zero, right? Because it stopped. And so you only have the um, Uf, the final, um, the final poten potential energy is one half kf squared. Th there we go. Um, and we do the same thing and then we just say, okay, now we're going to solve with the conservation of energy. If you don't have enough room for, for a step, then you probably, if you probably put more than one step together and um, split them up. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, for each one of these steps, 
uh, you're going to get one point for um, giving me giving me a um, description, right? Write the energy before and after, and then two points for actually doing whatever you, whatever it is you do, and um, then I'll prorate that to thirty points. So if I you only had one step uh, and you screwed up the um, the calculations. Uh, then you might only get um, one point for those and you write something down you get one point for that so you only get 20 points out of 30. Um, so it's good for you to do separate steps that you you can identify what you're actually doing because uh, that way you'll lose fewer points for any particular error right um, and when I prorate things out. Now it's probably not a good idea to you know do one tiny little thing in each one because you know that's that's something that you might do in middle middle school when um, you're not quite as sophisticated as you are now um, but now you're going to want to do um, more things at once and you can see here I, I do take a little bit of time to solve for um, delta x it's just a straightforward um, algebraic solution Now we want to check what we've done, right? So I've got my algebraic solution. I've written that down here so you can see what it was. It was the compression is equal to the square root of the mass over the um, spring constant um, times the um, velocity. So, so these, um, so this thing I want to make sure it's dimensionally homogeneous. That means I want what's on the left hand side to have the same dimensions as what's on the right hand side and additionally if I have uh, another term on the right hand side you know if this was plus some constant I want to make sure that all of the other thing all of the terms that are added to this term have the same um, dimensionality because they have to right that's a, that's a rule about dimensions you can only add things that are that have the same dimensions um, you know the apples and the oranges and all that jazz so how I check it is I just look at the dimensions of each thing now the left hand side is easy right since I have a solution the left hand side is easy because I already should know what this thing is so, so I look at my units here I put them in brackets um, if I look at that that would be in the units of meters and so the dimension of meters is um, like easy enough to do um, and then you do it's a do a little more complicated work it's a little more complicated when you do the right hand side so you sort of manipulate that as you go along so you have a square root of m of the ratio of m and k so that means you have a square root of m so i have bracket m uh, bracket to the one half and i have um, one over the square root of k so i have bracket k bracket to the minus one half um, and then I just have the velocity, so I have bracket V, um, close bracket. And then I just put down after that the um, dimensions of each one of those. So you have the mass, it has dimensions of M mass, which is one half, and it's raised to the one half power. Uh, K, the spring constant is kilograms per second squared, so I put that there and I raise it to the minus one half power, and the velocity is. Um, uh, meters per second or length over time uh, and I put that there. I do a little bit of canceling and I get L which means that w that this um, mathematical expression on the right hand side has the same dimensionality as the variable on the left hand side uh, which is what we want. It's dimensionally homogeneous. I want you to tell me that it's dimensionally ho homogeneous. Say yes it is correctly stated as far as the dimensionality is concerned and then you get five points. Um, for 12, you want to you want to look at how reasonable the answer is. You want to have some rationale for it. Um, is it within a good range, right? Is it somewhere in the middle of um, some set of numbers? Uh, that would be one thing. That's not what we're using here, but that that would be one thing. Uh, here, I'm looking at the functional form, right? And I'm saying, well, if the um, if I have a heavier cart, it'll 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 have to compress the spring more, right? Um, that that makes sense. The, the heavier the cart, the more it has to compress the spring. 
So, so that's my um, that's my condition. So I need you get two points for for figuring out that test. Uh, then I say, okay, well, the mass is in the numerator, right? If the mass is in the numerator, then um, the larger it is, the uh, more compression I'm going to have, right? So, um, so fi and fi so that means that the object compresses more when the, when the mass is greater and the um, condition, this uh, the test is met. So it's a good um, it's a good test, or, or that we pass the test. Our solution is okay. So we can go ahead and see if we can finally answer our question. Okay, so it, now I want to I want to ask, does it answer the question? Right. Um, now I already went through a whole spiel about this, so we know that no, it doesn't. Right. But I'll, I'll, I want to I want to show you what I want you to tell me. Right. So first, you tell me what it is you want. You know, we actually asked for in um, question one B. We wanted to know this maximum safe speed. Um, and then I want you to tell me what it is that you found. Well, I found the um, compression for a given speed, so I, I didn't I didn't find this um, maximum safe speed, right? So I want you to tell me what you need to do. Well, I need to find that. I need to use that compression to find the maximum safe speed, and and that and that's all you need to do for um, part four C. So now I didn't answer that question, which means that I have to go ahead and find a way to answer it with what I've what I've done in my solution. So that's the first thing I've done is I've restated that that solution, right? And the delta x is equal to the square root of m, the square root of the ratio of m and k times the velocity. Um, so I want to use that um, restatement and say what kind of comparisons I need to make. Well, in this case, I need to take delta x, the compression, and set it equal to the uh, maximum compression. And that will give me the limit of the speed as well when I do a solution. So I'll go ahead and um, do the solution uh, um, under those conditions, and I get the maximum safe speed is equal to the square root of k over m um, times the uh, ma maximum compression itself. So. That's basically all you need to do. Just put things in really quickly like that. Um, give me a sentence or two and everything will be okay. And now, like I said, I want to show you what, what would happen. Now, if I actually solved for Vm in step three rather than um, delta x, uh, if I'd say solved for this maximum compression rather than or this maximum safe speed rather than the um, compression for any given um, initial velocity, then uh, this is how I'd, I'd um, write out the solution. So this is all in sort of some conditional never-never land. Uh, this is not something you'd have to do in this problem, but another way to solve it, you'd have to do it this way. So I still want you to know how I want you to how I want you to do this particular case. Um, so. Now I still write down what my solution was, right? In the hypothetical, I find Vm is equal to the square root of k over m times L in the step three. Um, and then I graph it, right? And you have to choose how you're going to graph it. Um, in this case, I'm going to graph it with um, Vm on the y-axis. In fact, your left-hand side should probably always be on that y-axis. And I'll use 1 over m on the right-hand side. And then I draw this curve that um, is less than a linear curve. So the dashed line is a linear curve. Um, and that's not what I get. I actually get something, something like um, x to the 1 half, 1 over m to the 1 half um, going up like that. And so it doesn't, make the, it, it doesn't increase as fast as um, uh, just 1 over m would. So that's the sort of thing I want you to do. I just want a qualitative plot, right? You need to know how to plot things, and you need to know how to interpret plots. That's what you're going to do for the next 40 years of your life. Um, and then I give some information about what that uh, answer actually means. It, that means that um, the greater my payload, right, uh, the less uh, the less speed I can actually use, right? 
And in fact, um, as I increase my payload, I, I have to, I have to, I get um, less and less speed out of it. Um, so that's pretty much it. So hopefully that's a sufficient for you. Hopefully that's a sufficient description of how I'm going to grade your homework so that you do a really good job. All right. And like I said in class, I really don't want to have to go through this and um, go through several iter iterations with you on how I, I just on how to report the homework. So that's why I've made this video. Okay. I, I don't want to go through those several iterations and have you start out with a poor grade because I, because I didn't um, give, give you this. Uh, or more to the point, um, what usually happens is that most students don't start looking at their, um, their, they don't actually start looking at their graded homework until after they see the midterm grade. Um, that's not you. I know you're the good student who actually looks at the homework as soon as I turn it back. But, uh, you, you know, there are some students, I'm telling you that right now, that um, just put their, you know, they, you give the homework back, at all graded, and with suggestions on how to improve and how to get more points and um, stuff like that. And it just goes in a folder, hopefully a folder. Um, that hopefully it doesn't go to it, it get filed in um, file file 86. Um, so uh, it, they just put the homework in a folder and they don't bother to look at it for um, for four for four months, uh, possibly pulling it out for the final. Um, so please do um, keep all this in mind while you are. Uh, while you are really doing your homework for the first time, for the second time, by the third time, I'm sure we'll get we'll get you working um, really smoothly with these uh, with these rubrics. Um, thank you very much. And now I'm going to see if I can edit this and actually make it make it work. Bye now.